Now, uh, this setup, when I first thought of it, I thought you couldn't do it with a simulation because it's kind of a three-dimensional setup. But um, I'm doing this recording now because I realized uh, uh, I can actually do this uh, with a simulation. There are some advanced uh, features of Algodoo that you can use that will allow you to run this simulation. And I think you can kind of uh, take advantage of the fact that it's a simulation and do some things that are actually difficult to do in lab. So let me do that. Uh, this is what I'm going to do. So um, the, you can kind of read the introductory material on your own. By the way, I do recommend that you don't really pay attention to this video until you have actually uh, covered the rotational inertia um, enough that you feel somewhat familiar with the idea of torque. Um, and yeah, and I think the way this lab is spaced in the place in the course is that you don't need to know a whole bunch about rotational inertia, but you do have to know uh, what torque is, that is a uh, lever arm times force. So, you know, if you <laughs> haven't gotten that far, cover that first before you watch this video. So, um, so let me just uh, kind of try to work through this lab using the simulation to illustrate what I can illustrate. Um, yeah, so now the part A will have to be a bit repurposed because it says hands-on exercises. And really the main purpose of this part as written was so that you can take a look at the setup and kind of feel what um, different amounts of rotational inertia feels like. Um, I think I can still do a bit of that demonstration using the simulation. Let me give it a try. Um, by the way, because I'll be using uh, some of the more advanced the features of simulation. Um, I'm, not going, I'm, I'm not going to provide you with a file. I'll just start from scratch. I have some things that I've been playing with um, just so that I know what I'll be doing in this real time recorded video. But let's just start from scratch. So I, in this simulation, I want to make a version of the setup that represents what you see in the lab. So I think what I'm uh, thinking of creating is basically this setup. The part that's important is this rotating setup. And I think when I'm making it with a 2D simulation, it's uh, most easily represented as something that you look at from top. Now, um, yeah, and I guess, um, yeah, yeah, let me start with that. And I guess maybe um, I should take uh, some precautions so that um, it's as representative of the setup as possible. So what I think I should do is, hmm, uh, let me, uh, I think this uh, particular setting is fine, but what I do want to do is, I want to get rid of the ground because the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm going to get rid of gravity so that if I have something there and just to let the simulation run, it shouldn't move. It, it, the gravity is not running, so it shouldn't move. Oops. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, um, the, um, so this uh, represents really what you would see. If you look at some object in a top-down view, then gravitational force is downward and there's some normal force and stuff that's supporting it. As far as what you see on the plane goes, it's uh, not going to be affected by gravity. So that's my goal here. So let me start up by drawing a bar. And uh, let me just make it some kind of round number. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going to pivot it by the center by adding a center axle. So geometry actions at the center axle. And when I run the simulation, Nothing happens. Now I can uh, rotate it by hand. Um, that's always possible. Now the problem is uh, this is not a real hand. So you can see what it feels like. I mean, I can turn on print force, 
and kind of do that. But even then, I think it's uh, really cumbersome to track what that print force says. So I think what will be more illustrative is if I use a thruster. I think you've seen me use this in the past. So with this thruster, I can apply a known amount of force. Uh, let me select a toggle key here and make it a toggle. So um, by turning on this thruster, I can show you how the, this rod would uh, uh, react if you apply some fixed amount of force. And even though you don't won't have a feeling how much the fixed amount of force, the fact that it's a fixed amount will allow you to compare different uh, setups. That really was the purpose and intent and purpose of the part A. So I think this way of illustrating it with the simulation will get at some aspect of that. By the way, um, just so that when I'm controlling the simulation with the keyboard, it doesn't confuse people. When you see the simulation starting or stopping, I'm using my space bar. That's how I, I'm, you know, without clicking anywhere, I'm able to start and stop simulation. And you saw me select T as the toggle key there. So that's what I use while the simulation is running, whether to start or stop the um, thruster. So uh, let me point you to the portion of the lab manual, which kind of gets at what I'm saying here. It's uh, you know, directing you to um, gently rotate the apparatus, rotating it back and forth to get a sense of its inertia. You won't really be able to do that. What you can do is um, you know, um, let the simulation run, turn the thrust on for, I don't know, maybe five seconds at some fixed force value. So one, two, three, four, five. So that's how much it's rotated. And you can use that to kind of a gain sense or gain a feeling of what rotational inertia is like. So I guess in different contexts, it's almost like a flying by wire. Um, so you are not able to touch things with your hand and have an intuitive feel for it, but you can kind, it's a combination of number sense and some aspect of interaction and intuition. You are kind of um, using the sensors to fly. <laughs> I don't know, it's not a good analogy, especially at the level of physics for me. Um, so, um, yeah, so in this part, this is really what I have you do, you know, first move the masses in as close to the center as possible. So where you have an arrangement with a, with a minimum possible amount of rotation inertia, and you do that exercise of trying to rotate the thing to get a kind of feeling for what rotation inertia feels like. And then later on, um, I will have you, let's see. Ah, move the masses as far out along the horizontal rod as possible. So maximize the rotational inertia, I think. <laughs> You're supposed to figure that out in the lab. Maximize the rotational inertia and get the feeling that, get the feeling that the rotational inertia has indeed changed. And this estimate, you know, it's kind of, you know, uh, it's a very rough estimate uh, for one, because I don't give you exactly what it is that you are measuring. It just says to you how much harder was it. And, you know, this is all meant to be qualitative, not quantitative, even when I'm apparently asking a quantitative question. So uh, let me kind of go through that exercise here. So I have just, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, unweighted rod. And I guess that's not quite enough. I need to add weight to it. By the way, that <laughs> bright color is a little bit getting in my way. Let me uh, make it a little bit, uh, I don't know. Maybe I should have gray, maybe. All right, uh, let me add the masses here. So um, I guess I should have start out with what I said at the beginning, you know, move the masses in as closely as possible. So I think I'm going to use a circle for mass because um, it's, uh, um, 
uh, it's easier to position for one. By the way, apparently this is the idea of April Fool's for Algodoo. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to close it. <laughs> um, yeah, let me change the color, make it a little bit darker. Um, yeah, and um, I want to set the masses so that they are relatively representative. So I have the radius mass of 2.4 kilograms, okay. Uh, by the way, it won't be a realistic amount of mass. I just want to make sure they are uh, in relative terms uh, reasonable. So in the, your real lab, I know the masses we hang are 500 grams or half a kilogram, and the rod is much lighter than that. So if the rod here is 2.4 kilograms, then the mass should be at least 10 kilograms for it to be um, kind of, for this simulation to be a representative um, setup of your lab. So let me place this mass here. And I'm going to clone it to make a copy of it over here. So this is the kind of the symmetric arrangement. And uh, what I need to do now is, so this is why I need to do what I'm going to do next. Watch here, what happens if I let the simulation run. Didn't I turn off gravity? Uh, um, uh, well, let me set the material this way. Make this one kilogram and make that uh, five kilogram. I think that's relatively reasonable. Let me see here. Okay, gravity is still off. I don't know why it was buggy before. Um, oh, I think I know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it wasn't gravity. It's actually these two things are, um, they're colliding with each other. So that's why when I let go, um, they are, so what it is is that these two, objects are repelling uh, the rod because they're kind of overlapping. And it's like if things are overlapping in real life, the simulation has it so that two things are able to collide. They don't overlap naturally. So that's why when I let the simulation run, it does this. Now, there's something you can do so that the simulation doesn't do that. You can glue these objects together. They still retain their distinct identities. But when you go into geometry action, actions and glue together, then they become glued together and they won't come apart. They'll just stay where they are. Okay, so this is the setup with um, the masses as close as possible, what you would call the minimum uh, rotational inertia setup. And let me now add the thruster here, somewhere in the middle, so that it doesn't get in the way when I do the next part. And um, I guess five Newton is probably fine. Let me set the activation key here, toggle. And, and let's let the simulation run. I'm gonna let it run for, let's try three seconds. So I'm gonna count thousand one, thousand two, thousand three. Okay. Thousand one, thousand two, thousand three. Okay, so by the time I turned this off, um, the thruster starting from the positive X axis, it went to about here or so. And by the way, this is eventually going to come to a stop. The biggest reason of which is that I have the air resistance turned on. And I think that's realistic, so uh, let me do that. So this is kind of a way to get a feel for rotational inertia. And this is what we kind of mean by rotational inertia. It's a resistance to rotation. It kind of goes back to this definition of torque torque is what causes rotation in the sense of angular acceleration and rotational inertia is what makes that happen less. The larger the rotational inertia is, the smaller the angular acceleration has to be for a given amount of torque. So that's what you're seeing here. Uh, when I let the simulation run, right now it's not rotating and having the thruster on at this point providing torque by way of applying force. It causes it to angularly accelerate. Uh, 
And with this one setup, uh, it might be not all that clear how rotational inertia registers uh, angular acceleration. So let me just do something that I think will change the rotational inertia. So I am going to move these masses out as uh, directed in the lab. So I'm going to move this. Oops. Can I just select one? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's because they're glued together. Let me unglue. Let me move this way out here. And same thing here. I need to unglue. And I'll have to remember to glue them back together before I let the simulation run. So by the way, uh, when I'm selecting more than one, I'm doing control and click. Control click allows you to select an additional element without unselecting what you have already selected. So glue together. All right, so now that you don't move, good. So I'm going to turn on this thruster, same amount of force, same position. So it's gotta be same torque for three seconds again. So 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. And you can see that it has angularly accelerated less. It moved in, um, moved in uh, angular position less than it did before. So, so yeah, and you can even take a kind of a bit of a measure. So when I did it before, um, this uh, with the same amount of force, the same duration, it went from this position to around here. So, um, so that was, I don't know. So the whole, one whole thing is 180 degrees. I guess that must be maybe 120 degrees or so. That's how far it moved. So let me do this again and let's see how far it moves now. So 1,001, 1,002, all right, so from here to here, I want to say that uh, something less than 45 degrees, maybe 40 degrees, 30 degrees. So if you are comparing angles, you might say, oh, this takes three times or four times as much effort as what the previous one did. And once again, this uh, idea of effort here is very loosely defined. It's an, I'm not actually trying to be quantitative. So when you do measure the distances here, what's the best way to measure distance? Do I have a ruler? I think I can just build a ruler. Oh, temporary ruler. Oh, I actually, yeah, yeah. I think there's a way to do a ruler mark. Uh, yeah, ruler. So, um, yeah, so before when this mess was before when this mess was over here, then uh, you have different ways of measuring things. I think I like to do center to center. So, so doing it from this center here, about three meter mark to the center here in this kind of oversized scale, it's uh, 50 centimeters. So the distance went from 50 centimeters to center to center, so 50, well, um, so two meters, 2.5, so about five times the distance. And if you are going by what I measured before, you know, five times the distance, um, about four times the effort. Ah, interesting. Um, is it, so is it some kind of linear relationship? We'll do that more precisely in a bit, but at least uh, uh, with the exercises in part A, with this, um, kind of playing around with the setting um, or, you know, in, in the in-person lab, kind of just moving things around, touching, <laughs> you um, get kind of a sensation that the rotational inertia, it depends on not just the amount of masses because I have the same amount of mass that I started out with before. So not just the amount of mass, but also the location of mass. And one other thing, this is what a lot of people kind of miss or make mistake when they are um, kind of trying to think through what rotational inertia depends on. And, you know, it's easy to, for people to say, oh, it depends on where 
center of masses and um, so you know say rotational inertia it depends on the amount of mass and center of mass and stop there that's a mistake watch here when I move the masses from here to out here look at two things that stay the same the amount of mass stay the same and the center of mass especially if I move this out here the center of mass is still here so in this setup, you can clearly see that even when you have the same amount of mass and same center of mass, rotational inertia can change. So what you have to look for here is, um, what else does rotational inertia depend on? And what you are seeing here is that it depends on the distribution of mass. Basically, every possible detail here, not only how much mass is, how much mass there is, and where those masses are, they all matter. If you rearrange the masses so that they are in different locations, while the center of mass remains the same, rotational inertia will still change. So that's a kind of a part A, and you know, in person that would have been more fun, but that's the kind of demonstration. And part B is really, um, you know, what I would have been excited about <laughs> for your real lab. And, um, and really the whole lab is written around this apparatus. I, we had this in the stock room and I realized uh, you can actually make it quantitative. You can put in a known fixed amount of energy into to this rotating mass and using that known amount of energy, you can kind of have a way of calculating rotational inertia. And that's what part B is written around. And what I'll have to do now is I'll preserve some aspects of that setup, but um, I will kind of change it so that it's doable with this simulation. And I think I'm actually going to demonstrate one more way that can only be done in a simulation that's probably actually better than what you see with the physical setup. So uh, let me take a short break. I'm just gonna cause, pause the recording for a bit and then I'll come back and I will kind of walk you through building a setup that can allow you to do the same kind of activity that you, not same, similar kind of activity that you would have done in part B. So I'll be back right after these messages. Welcome back. So this is the idea behind part B, uh, measuring rotation inertia. Well, you know, idea. <laughs> it says all the energy is conserved in the setup. You should have gotten that sense that it's a pretty much a frictionless. And this is what it says. By hanging a mass over the pulley and letting it fall, you can transfer a known amount of energy to the rotating masses. So looking at this setup, we are, const uh, let me go. Looking at this setup, what I'm saying is, okay, you will have some hanging mass. And if this mass falls, falls through them some distance, it's uh, losing some energy. <laughs> and it's a transferring that amount of energy to something else. And in this system, the only something else that seems like energy can go to is this is going to be these rotating masses. So we'll assume that that is where the energy has gone. So, so that's the setup. And um, so you have some way of basically being able to determine the rotational kinetic energy through direct measurement of something other than rotational motion. And you can relate that to the rotational motion, um, angular velocity of the rotating masses, and it's a rotational inertia I. And it's a DC relationship that you can use to be able to measure I, rotational inertia, without really knowing anything about what determines rotational inertia. I mean, you know, in your homework, in your whatever, you get to find out uh, what factors actually determine rotational inertia. Uh, but this lab was initially written for um, the, 
written for someone looking at this at the beginning of chapter 10, where you barely know torque and you don't really know about rotation and inertia. So that's the setup. I think some of the things I say here, you can probably uh, skip that. Like, uh, you know, I think I give you some way to try to uh, figure out the angular velocity. Like, we, we can just measure that directly in the simulation, that's it's enough. And um, I think what I want to do is, I want to just to take a few measurements, um, use this to determine, um, um, use this to, I guess, transfer a known amount of kinetic energy to the rotating setup. And then looking at that, figure out um, how rotational inertia depends on the distance of the masses to the pivot point. So uh, let me first try to make up that uh, as close to this as possible. Um, so setting that up in the simulator, uh, let me start out with a new version. Uh, this time I'm not going to turn off the gravity because you are actually going to need the gravity to um, do its thing. So uh, let me do this. Let me first uh, make a pulley. So I'm simplifying the setup a little bit here in the lab. It's uh, trying to kind of um, transfer this uh, horizontal kind of rotational thing into a vertical motion. That's why pull is set up this way. Uh, let me just uh, collapse all this into one because I have only one two-dimensional plane. So I'm just going to have one rotating thing and it will be oriented vertically so that the rotating thing will, um, it will be connected directly with something that falls vertically. So um, the place I'll start in trying to build that is I need to build a pulley. Uh, let me turn on the grid so that I can do this with a little bit of precision. So here's a pulley. Um, now that's probably enough. I don't think I need that super big. A little bit bigger. Yeah, maybe a little bit bigger. Okay, let me do that. And you know, it's supposed to be massless pulley. So I'm just gonna set it to mass to some relatively small value that hopefully won't cause the uh, simulation to bug out. Okay, so I have the pulley built. Then what I need now is the string uh, to go around the pulley where I can hang a mass on. Um, and yeah, so let me get a string here. Uh, make sure this is... Uh, it looks a little bit thin, but I think it's fine. So let me go with that. I'm going to turn off the grid because with the grid, the string thing looks a little bit jagged. I can do it less jagged if I don't have the grid. Okay, so I'm gonna go around once, um, twice, and let me just do a three times for good measure. Okay. Um, now I need to remove um, this thing at the end here because um, you can kind of see it if you zoom in a lot. When you zoom in a lot, this is what you see. You can see how they are simulating these strings. They simulate it by simulating these uh, relatively small pieces and jo they join them together with these um, anchor point, anchor point, pivot point, anchor. I think it's called anchor, uh, the axle. <laughs> they, they join them together with these axles. Now, what this uh, end point axle has done is uh, it uh, anchored this last piece to the background. And I don't really want that. I don't want this stuck to the background. So I'm gonna just delete this last piece. So this end now is a free hanging piece. I can kind of, um, so it'll be free hanging piece. And let me just uh, verify the setup here. Here, uh, this uh, axle should be attached to uh, this uh, thing, disc. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's how it should be set up. Let me let the simulation run so that I can tighten it around and, um, and you know, have it more presentable. And oops, uh, I don't want that to fall. Let me undo. And 
um, uh, I need to um, I need to add a center axle for this thing so that it'll um, it won't fall into cent center axle and do I, that's so such a big thing I don't think it needs to be that big and ugly so let me make it a little bit smaller all right um, let me just make sure it, yeah, I don't think axles have any mass values all right so let me let the simulation run and okay yeah yeah that's kind of what I was expecting to happen and oh, 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 oh. wait what, what's going on um, hmm. let me undo undo all right, um, let me temporarily glue this to the background so that it won't rotate freely while I'm trying to uh, hang it around. And I think once I kind of got it around, then, um, then I can unglue it from background. All right, I got that. Let me just kind of tighten it a little bit. And as I, I think I mentioned this in a previous session before, String simulation is super um, finicky. So that's why I'm trying to be relatively careful here. Um, it's got some features that a lot, that's a kind of nice. If you go into the string property, it'll tell you um, some of its properties, such as it has this property where it doesn't collide with itself. So this pr uh, string can wrap around on itself as many times as I want. That's kind of nice thing to have. Otherwise, I would have to worry about what happens if I wrap around too many times. But that's fine. It doesn't collide with itself. Just want to make sure it's not. It doesn't form too much of a kink uh, around the different places. Ah, yeah, that's what I mean by bulky. Uh, all right, so I have to be careful not to apply too much force. All right, uh, that seems in a. Yeah. Mm, I guess that's uh, maybe a little bit too long. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, after this comes to a stop, I'm just gonna delete some of these um, segments so that I have a string uh, that ends around here. I wonder if I need to wait until it stops. Yeah, and I think if I remember this right, you can't really, um, you can select more than one segment without selecting the whole rope. So I'm just gonna do it one by one. As tedious as this is, that's the quickest and the easiest way to do this. All right. Almost there, I think. All right, that seems good. Now, simulation is actually still running. Nothing's moving because this is glued to the background. But if I have it so that it's uh, no longer glued to background, then, uh, yeah, you see it moving a little bit. Let me see if I can add a little bit of friction to the axle to stop that. Um, break. Sure, why not? I don't know. No? Mm. I actually this is not one of the settings I played with, so I'm not quite sure. Okay, I guess that, that a motor took set limit of how much uh, force the brake can apply. Yeah, yeah, you can still overcome it with enough force. All right, this seems good. Um, I have this set up. So what I need to complete is I need a hanging mess so that hanging mess can here hang here and it'll be able to apply a known amount of torque. Uh, so let me make a hanging mass here. Um, I'm not quite sure how much mass it should be. Mm. Sorry, I'm trying to make it 0. 0.5 by 0. 0.5. All right, there we go. Um, 
let me make it two kilograms. I think that's uh, probably substantial enough. And I learned how to do this uh, as I was playing with this, how to attach um, the hanging mess to the rope or any object to the rope. This is how you do it. I um, don't know if it needs to be in the back, but you add an axle at this point here, fixate. Fixate, no, that's uh, welding it, axle tool, yeah. This will add an axle here. And um, when I let the simulation run, yeah, you'll see that this hangs from here and it doesn't fall any farther. Yeah, and if I change this axle property so that it's not able to provide quite as much torque, then um, it'll start to fall. So, yeah. All right, that seems good enough. Let me kind of um, apply some amount of force to bring it back. And um, this setup in itself can actually do uh, some aspect of that experiment because this is what you can do. You can plot these things. You can um, oh, show plot. Oh. You can plot the y position, not the velocity, y position of the uh, hanging mass. And you can also plot the angular velocity of this disk. Uh, angular velocity. And you can let it run. Oh, wait, wait, I need to get rid of the brake entirely. No break. You can let it run and kind of stop it before it completely hits the ground. Then what you have is you have a change in the Y position from which you can calculate the um, calculate the uh, change in gravitational potential energy, and which will give you the kinetic energy, or under certain assumptions, <laughs> kinetic energy of this rotational kinetic energy of the disk. And you can tie that to the angular velocity here and use that to calculate what the, the rotational inertia of the disk is. And if that's all you want to do, just to calculate the rotational inertia of some object in a fixed setting, great, you are done and you go home, what did you accomplish? <laughs> so, so that's why I won't be using this object to set up. I'll add a little bit of addition to it because really what's uh, valuable in a lab or what should be valuable when you do a real lab is the ability to investigate, ability to change some parameters, predict how it's gonna do and be able to see that it does the thing that you thought it was gonna do. So. <laughs> Um, now, in this setup, it's really difficult to change the parameters. I guess you can change the amount of mass, uh, and that's basically like changing the size of this. That all takes a whole lot of work. So I'm not gonna be doing that. <laughs> now, what I can do is uh, I can add additional objects to it. Now, you do have to be careful how you do it. So let me show this to you. That's uh, kind of the reason that I want you to do this by, uh, do this in real time so that I can show you how I'm building it rather than giving you a finished file. So um, I'm doing this rather thing, the same, oh, I don't know. Is that that, no, that's not the center. Okay, so the center of the rod is I think around the beginning of the number. So, uh, <laughs> so I have this rod, which is similar to the uh, rod I was using before. Or, or what happened here? I don't know. I thought I just uh, drew a rod. Mm. I don't know. Um, let me, I'm going to add a, a center axle just so that I know where the center of this rod is, uh, but I'm gonna delete it soonish. Yeah, there it is. And let me delete the center axle. Um, let me send this to the back. Now, when you do this, um, 
it, uh, if you simply run the simulation at this point, um, it won't work right. It's because this rod will be colliding with everything. And that's uh, certainly not the intent. At a minimum, this rod needs to be glued to this disk. So that these two things, I'm doing control click, two things rotate together, they move together. So let me do that. Do the um, geometric action and glue together. So whenever as this disk rotates, this rod should be rotating with it. Now, even after having done that, it still won't work right. I think I can maybe demonstrate, can I? Let me see. Yep. <laughs> You see how it doesn't work right. Uh, the, the rope doesn't like it. It's overlapping with the rod. Now, uh, this is the advanced feature of Algodoo that you can use. It has something called the collision layers. It's basically allowing you to simulate kind of a three-dimensional aspect of things. So that when you have a two-dimensional view of something and they're overlapping in that view, that doesn't necessarily mean that the two objects are uh, on top of each other. Like my two, thing, two hands here, they could be offset in different planes so that even when they overlap, my hands are not colliding with each other. So I can do that. So all the things I've drawn so far are on collision layer A. So I can put this rod on collision layer B. That'll make sure that it collides with basically nothing in collision layer A. So when I run this, then it should run fine in the sense that it doesn't do anything. Do I still have the break thing built? Yeah. So, yeah. And that's uh, how it should work. All right. Um, so I guess I can kind of do some quick measurements with this. So what I'm going to do is, uh, let me just do quick three runs. I'm going to do it one with the empty rod, two with uh, rod and um, two, um, rather than two additional uh, masses as close as possible, and then um, three, two additional masses again, but um, as far as possible. So let me, I'm going to track the angular velocity of this uh, disk. So, so let me do that here. And let's see what happens. Uh, I'm just going to try to stop the sim simulation before this hits the ground. Oh, wait, wait, I still have that disk. Uh, break. So let me undo that break. All right. All right, that's kind of what that looks like. Mm, interesting. Now, the way this uh, simulation plots of things, it, as long as I don't hit this clear, it lets me plot different things within the same plot. So that makes it super easier to compare. So let me add two masses to this rod thingy. Uh, by the way, what's the mass of the rod? Is it 2.5 kilograms? It's a little bit heavy uh, for my taste, but uh, let me just leave it there. I, I think uh, we can manage that. Um, so let me just... Uh, Add uh, two masses are here. And uh, let me set the, um, uh, the property of mass so that it's a fairly substantial. It's uh, at least a five or about five times as large as the rod's mass. So, and then clone it. By the way, in this simulation especially, it's important that, um, uh, it's important that this is set up symmetrically because the rotation is a vertical, unless it's a symmetric, then you have to worry about the change in the gravitational potential energy of that thing and it gets complicated. Okay, these two masses, let me make sure they are on the correct collision layer. I want them not colliding with any of the other things. So collision layer B. And I need to make sure that it's glued to the rod. So geometry actions glued together. All right, so let me let the simulation run after verifying that I got rid of the break. And then let's see where that goes. Um, yeah. 
All right, it's rotating slower than before. I'm gonna stop it again just before this hits the bottom. Mm, close enough. All right, that's uh, substantially slower. Uh, now these two are a little bit difficult to compare because um, it's uh, it's apples and oranges or apples and bananas. <laughs> What's uh, easier to compare? is after I have moved to do these two things out to the end. That'll uh, give me a better way to compare them. So let me just uh, loosen it. Yeah, okay, good. Um, and then move this out here. Loosen this. and move this out here. And once again, uh, fix them all together. So um, I guess I need to kind of see how those sizes compare. So when this was over here, the distance was around here. So that's about one meter. Now center to center, it's at two. So it's at about 2.7 times the distance that you was it before? All right, let's uh, let the simulation run and see. All right. So yeah, that kind of gives you to the comparison. So you have the angular velocity here. By the way, I think the way I set up all these three times, the change in height was about the same. So all these three curves, they represent where this entire apparatus has about the same amount of kinetic energy. And you are able to see how their final angular velocities compare. So comparing this angular velocity here, it's at about, um, 0.8 radians per second to here uh, 1. Um, 1.5 radians per second. So they are different by about a factor of two or so. And once again, this one's not all that comparable. So, so yeah, um, it's, um, it's uh, I guess uh, having, so, from this uh, qualitative result, what you would conclude, looking at um, this thing here, is this. So you have a setup where the amount of kinetic energy remains the same and angular velocity decreases. So you would conclude that rotational inertia for one setup versus the, so, rota so you would conclude the rotational inertia for one setup where the final angular velocity was larger, compare that to rotational inertia for the setup where final rotation angular velocity is smaller. You would say here is where rotational inertia is smaller. So that same kinetic energy, uh, larger angular velocity, you end up with a smaller rotational inertia. So, and you can actually do, um, uh, do a proper calculation. You can, um, so to do a proper calculation, this is what you don't need to do. You don't need to plot the actual um, height of the object. So you can plot it here and, um, and let it run, right. Yeah, I guess it's parabola. The constant change in angular velocity means constant angular acceleration. So yeah, constant ex linear acceleration, which would mean, um, you know, parabolic shape in the position, yeah. So uh, going from here to, you know, y equals 3.219 to, a y equals 0 0.516, so about 2.5 meter change. You know the mass, and so you can calculate change in gravitational potential energy. 
Let me make sure my graph is normal. Um, and so you have gravitational potential energy of this box. And one thing I'll tell you is that this is moving so slow, even though at this position, technically there's kinetic energy, that kinetic energy ends up being negligible. You can kind of say the change in gravitational potential energy, practically all of that went to this rotational kinetic energy of this whole thing. And um, so you get the number for rotational kinetic energy that way. And you measure angular velocity directly from here. And you combine those numbers in this formula to get I. And uh, you would label that I with some parameter. Like it's a parameter where the distance is at 2.5 meters. And then having done that, you would remeasure it uh, for the setup where these two are now uh, closer together at the one meter distance or so. Let me just quickly do that. Uh, around here. Around there, let me fix them again. And when you see it run, so the X position, oh, I guess even X position is gonna be a bit different because it's as a function of time. So, well, let me run it and see. Yeah, that's what it looks. Let me try to stop it when it reaches the bottom. Okay, yeah, as far as the final value of Y goes, it should be similar. And now you can look at, all right, so that is the, so change, same change in gravitational potential energy. So same kinetic energy, but now you have a different value of angular velocity. And uh, plugging that, that in, you can calculate the rotational kinetic energy, sorry, not rotational kinetic energy, rotational inertia, and you should find that it's smaller. And I can actually kind of do a quick uh, eyeballing calculation. So comparing this to that, I can say the angular velocity in this setup is about twice as large. So I look at the formula here. So if my angular velocity is twice as large, that means my rotational inertia is the you know uh, smaller by a factor of two to the squared. So rotation inertia is smaller by factor of a four. And that's where I'm hoping you will begin to see that when you compare the distances, the distance changed by a factor of you know, 2.5, two or so, but rotation inertia changed by a factor of four. So um, it's not linear, it's, it's not linear. Um, so, um, you, and you know, with the simulation you can, kind of do more detailed analysis, and you can eventually arrive at this effect kind of uh, through investigation, which is, uh, there it is. So this is kind of a theoretical value for um, rotational inertia. Rotational inertia of a point mass is mass times the po uh, distance of that mass from the axle squared. And uh, when you do the simulation this way, you will find that it doesn't fit that exactly, you should kind of think through why that might be. And because it's a simulation, you can kind of change the parameters here and try to get a more uh, accurate measurement of that. Now, so this is one way you can do it. And this is kind of trying to approximate your uh, real lab setup as close as possible. And, and, and you know, I guess that's a kind of reasonable. Maybe I should have just stopped there. Um, yeah, let me not go too deeply into the other thing other than to give you an idea of what you could do. So the uh, idea for what you could do is you can actually just use a thruster. And when you're doing that, I, I think you can even turn off gravity to make it even simpler. And with a thruster, what you can do is you can calculate the work done by thruster. So you have some amount of force it's applying and you can calculate the displacement as the circumference of the circle that it's going around. And whatever work the thruster does should be the energy that goes into kinetic energy of this rotating thing. And you know, that kind of thing is something kind of difficult to do in the in-person lab because it's hard to have a device that produces a fixed amount of thrust. But you can do that in the simulation and you can 
kind of see if uh, uh, using this uh, kind of idea of conservation of energy and uh, kind of transfer of energy through work done, if you can investigate rotational inertia. So, so you know, this is a fun thing to do in the lab. And uh, as you can see in the lab manual, it's not super complicated because going through all this procedure, it takes time. So I'm not gonna do that right now. But um, yeah, so that's the idea for the lab. And if you somehow still want to do it, uh, that algorithm simulation is how you can do it. And I think I've shown you all the features you need to know so that you can do it for yourself if you want to. And it's fine if you don't want to, uh, we'll cover this. Uh, I mean, a lot of this is covered in lecture and in terms of lab activity, I'll think of something that we can do that might address rotation, we'll see.